Alrighty, hey guys, it's been a while. Um, this is Kayla here from Journey Dog Training. And um, sorry for the absence. Um, like most of you guys, I took a bunch of time off for uh, the month of December, but we're back with a Training Tuesday. Just for those of you who have been watching these Training Tuesdays live, um, I don't think we'll be continuing to do the live Training Tuesdays anymore. As many of you know, I live and work remotely um, right now, so I'm currently in Costa Rica and it is beautiful. But um, the infrastructure for uh, live videos is just not there, um, which is part of the reason that I've missed a bunch of Training Tuesdays as well. Um, I might have had time, but I just couldn't get internet that worked. Um, but hopefully, as long as I'm recording these far enough in advance, I will be able to get them up to you guys on Tuesdays. So if I miss a Tuesday, I'm really sorry. Um, it's not because I've forgotten about you. It's just, you know, it's life. Um, just so you guys know as well, I am launching my first ever online course. Um, it is called Keeping Kids Safe and Dogs Happy and it focuses on helping parents understand how to encourage appropriate interactions between their kids and their dogs. Um, and it is also to help people understand the needs of their dogs, especially dogs around kids. So the dogs who might be a little bit nervous or overwhelmed by kids can um, live more successfully in homes with kids. If you do not have problems with dogs and kids, we are going to be launching a course on separation anxiety um, on March 1st with my partner, Aaron Jones, who's a certified dog behavior consultant, taking the lead on that. And if neither of those issues apply to you guys, um, you can still get help from us either through an email subscription service where you can email or text us as often as you need and we'll get back to you with your, um, with your answers, which is really great for online, or, um, ongoing problems like separation anxiety, dog cat intros, cat litter box problems, uh, potty training, crate training, all that good stuff. We also do one-off phone or video behavior consults, which is great if you've got a question. So I've had a bunch of people who are trying to decide whether or not to keep a dog that's dealing with some of the really serious behavior issues, or they're trying to get a second opinion before they go to a given trainer. Um, or I've done quite a bit with dogs that have resource guarding issues, phobias, all that sort of stuff. And again, we are both, um, myself and Aaron, we're both certified dog behavior consultants, which is one of the higher levels of training behavior consulting um, that you can get. So, <clears throat> all of that aside, I am uh, here today to answer some more listener questions. Um, and for those of you who missed our last listener questions, you can find that in the feed wherever you're watching this, or you can go to canineconvos.com, that is my podcast, and you can just catch that, um, that in a podcast episode as well. Um, because as you guys know, with these listener questions, I don't generally get up and do much. So if you're, um, if you're watching this in a video format, and you've got something that you want to be doing, you know, cooking dinner or whatever, that's okay because you don't really need to look at me for this particular episode. All right, so we've got five to get through today. It's quite a bit. So that is plenty of me gabbing and let's get to work. So our first one is from Trini um, and she has written saying that she has a one and a half year old lab that um, pulls a lot on walks um, and is pretty well trained. Um, when they want to go on walks, the dog gets really excited, but then Weird things been happening lately when she has been trying to put the dog's harness on. The dog has been shying away, um, which is weird to her because she thought he liked the walks. He doesn't seem to be nervous of the harness. The harness fits him. If anything, the harness is actually a little bit big on him. And um, she was just trying to figure out what's going on. So um, the first thing I would do whenever you see any behavior changes along this lines um, of something where all of a sudden the dog's behavior is changing or the dog seems to be scared of something and you can't figure out why, I always like to go and take this dog in to see a vet. So it could be that this dog all of a sudden doesn't like his harness because maybe he's got you know a slipped disc, torn shoulder, upset stomach, it could be anything. I'm not a vet, I can't tell you what it is, but your vet maybe can and there might be a really serious reason that your dog doesn't want to be putting that harness on. So we always want to rule out pain or discomfort when we're seeing any behavior changes. So that's the first step for Trini is we're going to go in and see the vet. The next step is um, I would actually like to change up the harness. It sounds like she's got a harness that kind of slips on over the dog's head. Um, what if we can get something that clips instead? So there are quite a few harnesses that instead of, you know, having to like get it over the dog's head, um, you can buckle here and then buckle here. 
Um, and I would look at doing something like that instead for this dog because it sounds like going over the head is the problem. Then the third thing that I would do is I would teach this dog to do a hand target. Um, and I have a whole bunch of videos on teaching hand targets. You can either see a super short version with Poppy the cat or a longer version with Winston the corgi puppy where I actually literally take Winston the corgi puppy from like day zero knowing nothing all the way through to a pretty decent little target. Um, and you can see those videos again basically wherever you're watching this now if you just scroll through to my older videos. Both of those are from October of 2018 so that'll help you find them. Um, and then I would start using that hand target to get the dog to come towards the harness of her own accord. Um, and all of that should pretty much take it. And the last thing I wanted to address for Trini was that she kind of at the end said that she felt like the dog maybe was stubborn and testing her boundaries and trying to figure out how much he could get away with. And my guess is that that is not correct. Most dogs are not really trying to figure out what they can get away with or anything. Their behavior has a function. And my guess, if, the fun if this behavior is the dog is avoiding the harness, the function of that behavior is to stay away from the harness. It's not to seek status or to be stubborn or to test your boundaries or anything like that. So I hope that that makes a little bit of sense, but essentially I just wanna make sure the trainer understands that there's probably a reason that this dog is scared of the harness and it could be pain related. So really try hard not to think of your dog as being willfully disobedient or stubborn or testing his boundaries or anything like that because it really takes you out of that empathetic mindset where you can help to try to get inside your dog's head and think of why is my dog doing this and how can I get my dog what he wants in a way that also makes me happy. Um, and when you're labeling your dog as stubborn or disobedient or you're starting to assign these really serious and kind of devious motives to your dog, it really takes away from your own ability to, pro to problem solve. Um, so that's Trini and her, her lab who's got harness issues. Now let's go on to Erica who's got an eight month old German Shepherd who is terrified to get into the vehicle. So another pretty common problem, another scaredy dog. Um, and what we want to look at here is again, we're gonna actually stop right away at the vet for this dog. And that is because many dogs that are afraid of going into the car actually have issues with nausea. Um, the nice thing is, from what I understand from speaking to vets, most nausea medication is pretty harmless and you actually can essentially diagnose by treating. So what I mean by that is, can we give the dog a dose of nausea medication and then put the dog in the car and see if the dog's behavior changes. Because if the dog's behavior does change, then we know it's nausea. And then we know that how to fix it, okay? And if the dog's behavior doesn't change, then it's one of two things. Either A, it's not nausea, or B, it is nausea, but the dog has still learned the association between the car and nausea, so the dog is still acting upset even though the nausea is gone. So we can't guarantee that if the nausea medication doesn't work, that nausea isn't the problem, but we know we've also got a behavior problem there, okay? So first step, Talk to your vet, see if you can just do a little trial with some anti-nausea medication. I don't want to do um, anything with sedatives though. We want the dog to be awake, alert, we just don't want the dog to be feeling nauseous. So that's what we're looking at there. Again, I'm not a vet, I can't get medical advice, but this is pretty common um, and we do really want to rule out nausea um, when we've, whenever we've got a dog who's having issues with the vehicle. Um, and then they said that they were still having a hard time even when they were using treats. My guess, when people are having a hard time using treats in a situation like this, it's generally because they're asking for too much too soon for their animal. So it could be that they're sprinkling the treats in the back seat and the dog won't come all the way up to the back seat, hop in the car to eat the treats. So they're saying treats aren't working. That's not, I'm not judging them for that. Um, this is why I'm here because I know these things. But generally, if you've got an animal that's got a phobia of something, we can't just go straight to putting the treats where we want the animal to be and then having that work. The, it, it, it might work, but often it doesn't. So instead, what we might want to do is multiple times a day, just one minute training sessions, super short, we're going to take the dog outside, we're going to head on over to the car, and we're going to walk up to the car until just before the dog stops. We don't want to make the dog stop, but we want to know, okay, so generally we can get to within 10 feet of the car, so we're going to stop at 11 feet away from the car. We're going to stop, we're going to give some treats, and we're gonna back away. We're gonna come back, we're gonna stop at 11 feet, give some treats, walk away. S go up 10 feet, give some treats, walk away. End the training session, done, that's it. 
and then going back we're gonna st uh, go up to 10 feet give some treats walk back go up nine feet give some treats walk back and every time make sure when you start that new training session go back you know a half step or, or even a step or two just to make sure that you're still getting success at each level and it should feel really easy and it should feel kind of boring because you're not getting that fear response from the dog at all all we're doing is teaching the dog that what we're doing is awesome lots of treats okay and eventually we're going to get to a point where we get all the way up to the car give some treats back away get all the way up to the car open the car door give some treats back away all the way up to the car pause up into the car treats back off both feet in uh, you know front and hind feet into the car out back away um into the car close the door in the car close the door owner walks around in the car close the door owner walks around gets in front seat and you see so basically every time that we're saying that the treats aren't working what we probably need to do is we need to do what trainers call splitting and we just need to make that behavior smaller um so if you're getting stuck somewhere trying to think of how you can make that step smaller and then go back a little bit further and then try again and it's totally okay if if you get somewhere and the dog starts getting upset, just just end the training session. It's okay. You don't have to end on a high note. Just end the training session. Go play the game with your dog. Shake it off. It'll be okay. Try again tomorrow and keep it short. So, and then David has a question. Um, he lives with his sister. They both have dogs. Her dog is pee pad trained and his dog is not. And they're having problems where his dog is peeing inside now because her dog is peeing inside on the potty pads. So he wants to know how to keep transition his sister's dog to peeing outside. So two things right away here. Um, if he really wants to reduce the marking right away for his dog, what he can do is um, get a belly band and put that on his dog and that'll help keep his dog from urinating inside the house because his other, his sister's dog is clearly peeing on the potty pads. That's, you know, it, to David it's not ideal, but it's not as much of a problem as his other dog who seems to be peeing just anywhere. Um, so that's step one. We'll get a belly band or something, and that's just kind of triage, but that'll help reduce the pee in the house. Step two is we're going to get a black light, and we're going to get some enzymatic cleaner. I like Nature's Miracle, um, and we're going to super clean the house because as long as there are pee spots inside of the house, especially with a male dog, he's going to continue wanting to mark inside of the house. Some male dogs won't. Sounds like this one will. Um, and if you're listening to this and this is a problem that you're dealing with, we know that your dog will. So we need to get that black light so that we can find the pee spots and then we're gonna clean it super duper good with a pet specific cleaner. And that is important because most human cleaners only clean up things to our sight and our noses. And as we know, our dogs are a whole lot more sensitive. So you do need to get something that is pet specific. And I'll link to some, some recommendations below for that. Um, and then what we can start doing to actually transition his sister's dog to peeing outside is what I like to do is I will wait until I know that the dog probably needs to pee. And that might mean putting the dog inside of a crate behind a baby gate or inside of an X-Pen so that she can't go anywhere um, for, you know, a couple hours. Um, and then we're going to go outside. We're going to bring a potty pad with us and we're going to put that potty pad down on the grass. Um, and then we're going to stand there and we're going to do nothing. Just be a tree. Don't talk to the dog. Don't look at the dog. Just wait. As soon as the dog pees, give a bunch of treats, go back inside, repeat that over and over. Um, and eventually what we can start doing is eventually once the dog is going to the pet, going potty on the potty pad outdoors, relatively reliably, we can start cutting down that potty pad and making it smaller and smaller and smaller so that we're transitioning that dog to peeing on grass. Um, but the really important thing here is we need to manage both dogs appropriately and figure out how to get it so that the sister's dog is actually going to need to pee when we take her outside. Because if we just leave her inside with the potty pad, um, she's going to relieve herself whenever she needs to. And that's going to make it really hard for you to take her outside and have her pee when you need her to. So that might include some confinement, um... Nothing serious. I don't want this to turn into a thing where the dog is in the crate for 23 hours a day. Nothing like that at all. Just make sure that you can um, you can set her up where you know that she's going to need to pee relatively soon when you take her outside, okay? Um, and that's that for helping wean a dog off of a potty pad.
Okay, so Corey has kind of an interesting and sad story. Her dog, um, they believe that this dog was abused by someone at some point. And Corey mentions that um, the dog is really quick to cower, hide, um, is very, very jumpy with people. And there, um, and Corey dropped some socks the other day and her dog started getting them and chewing on them and ripped them up a little bit. And Corey, um, she said she didn't yell or hit the dog or anything, but she did use a firm voice and tap the dog on the butt um, to tell the dog no. And the dog like yelped and hid and is still skittish of her today, a day or two later. Yeah, several days later. Um, and she wants to know what to do. So these cases are really hard. When a dog has learned um, that people are dangerous and scary and then you breach that trust. Um, and again, it doesn't sound like Corey was doing anything crazy or super cruel or anything that we would normally consider really bad for a dog. Um, that still breached this dog's trust. Um, and now this dog is scared of her. So what I would like to start doing is first off for Corey, I would recommend with this particular dog, um, just absolutely cease any and all punishment, um, corrections. We're not swatting the dog. We're not uh, going to tap the dog on the butt. We're not even going to use a firm tone of voice with this dog. Um, and I generally avoid all of those things because as a certified dog behavior consultant, I adhere to the least intrusive, minimally aversive training framework, um, as I must as part of my certification. I also personally really adhere to the human hierarchy. Um, so I avoid all of those things in general. Um, but Corey doesn't know that. She's not a professional trainer, so that's fine. No judgment. But for this particular dog, we know that that action from a human is causing problems. So we absolutely need to stop that. Instead, what we can do is we can teach this dog a hand target, which again, you can find from Winston the Corgi or Poppy the Kitten um, from October 2018 in my feed. Um, and then we'll also teach her some mat training, which I think you can also find from October 2018 in my feed. It is a video called teaching your dog to be a rock star in public or teaching your dog uh, to be cool at cafes, pubs, etc. I don't remember what it's called, but it's there. Um, and I'll link to those below as well. Um, mat training and target training, basically those two things, if you can teach your dog those two behaviors with positive reinforcement, food-based training, all that good stuff, you are not going to need to correct your dog um, nearly as often because if you catch your dog with the socks, you can ask her to do a hand target, come over, your dog slaps her nose to your hand, you give her a bunch of treats. What do you know? When you feed your dog treats, she spits out the socks. There we go. We didn't need to teach the dog to drop it. We could just teach a hand target. Same if the dog's up on the couch, we want the dog off, hand target, dog's off the couch, voila, we didn't have to scold the dog. So we can do hand targets and mat training and the mat training is also useful if, you know, if you're cooking and you want the dog to get away from you, send her to her mat, get her away from you. Um, you don't have to shoo her out of the kitchen because again, this dog is really sensitive and we really need to be careful not to do that. And then for the immediate help to help rebuild this dog's trust in Corey, what we're going to do is play a little bit of the treat and retreat game, which you guys know is one of my favorites. And that is where instead of handing the dog treats or asking the dog to come to us to get treats, we're actually lobbing treats to the dog over the dog's head. Um, I, with dogs especially that are used to, or not, you know, not used to, but these dogs have been hit in the past, I like to fling my treats like this rather than like this because this looks like hitting. That might scare a dog, so if we flick with our wrists, this is usually much less scary. You can make it a small movement and you're going to flick those treats over to the dog behind the dog. And for this particular dog, what we might want to do is pick a couple things that we like from that dog that are our braver behaviors to preferentially reward those. So if the dog looks up at us, fling a treat. If the dog wags her tail at us, fling a treat. If the dog makes eye contact, fling a treat. If the dog shifts her weight forwards towards us, fling a treat. If she puts her ears up, fling a treat. Um, and again, we're tossing treats behind her. And what you'll start seeing is anticipation. So you toss the treat behind her, um, maybe not the first time, maybe not the 10th time, but eventually after she eats that treat, she's going to look back up at you and say, where's my treat? And then you can fling a treat to her for looking at you. And then the next time she might take a step towards you because she's ready for that treat. And then you can reward that behavior and you can just really build from there. Um, and I know this sounds a little bit extreme, but when I worked in Denver Dumb Friends League, 
the nation's fourth largest animal shelter. We worked with a lot of seriously traumatized dogs um, from really, really horrible situations. And this is one of the only things that consistently works for those dogs because getting them to come up to you for treats is just not gonna work. And eventually this dog will be able to take treats from you again, hopefully relatively quickly because you guys already have a relationship. But the treat and retreat is one of the best ways to rebuild that relationship, all right? The other thing I would add for Corey is just to try to read up as much as she can on dog body language um, and just see if she can start identifying some of the other things that make this dog a little bit nervous that don't result in a complete shutdown from this dog. So my favorite way to do this is using the Dog Decoder app. So if you just Google Dog Decoder app, it should come up. I think it's paid, but it's like two bucks, three bucks, four bucks. It's absolutely worth it. And you can start kind of flipping through this app. There are quizzes um, and pictures and all sorts of different things to really help you understand some of the more subtle ear movements, whisker movements, eye movements that let you know how your dog is feeling. And that's really important for these dogs because if we can start to identify when this dog is nervous before she's having a full blown freak out, um, then we can start to change our behavior and change the environment. So this little dog is gonna be more successful. Okay. Whew. And our last one. So Christina says she's got a healer who barks when people come into the house. Um, and she kind of likes that he's a guard dog, but the problem is her boyfriend works pretty late and comes in kind of in the middle of the night. And this dog is waking up and barking when her boyfriend comes in and it's really starting to impact Christina's sleep. So this is hard, but one of the things that we can do that hopefully will help teach this dog not to bark at the boyfriend, but maybe we'll keep the barking at the door um, if you do want your dog to bark when there's an intruder, is we can teach um, some sort of cue that means this is boyfriend coming in, it's not a big deal. Um, and that might mean installing an entirely new doorbell or um, maybe flashing a light if you've got a window, something that lets the dog know that it is the boyfriend coming. And then what we can do is Christina and or her boyfriend, every time they do that signal that they decide on, drop a bunch of treats. Your dog can't bark and swallow treats at the same time. Um, and even if your dog is barking, she's learning, she, she, um, she's learning that when someone does this signal and then comes in, it's okay, I get treats. And eventually that alarm barking is going to go away, even though we're technically giving treats when the dog is barking, all right? Um, but the important thing here is if you want to keep the barking at the door in general, we need to figure out a way to make it differentiable for her. In general, I find that my dog does not bark if, if we unlock the door, but he does bark if we knock at the door. Um, so that would also be an, op an option if the boyfriend has his own keys. You can just teach the dog that whenever someone uses their keys, um, they're going to drop treats, no need to bark. And, uh, and, and there we have it. Um, the problem is if you're really worried about someone coming in in the middle of the night, they're probably neither using keys nor knocking at the door. So it really depends on how much you want to keep that guard dog response. And it does get quite a bit more complicated. This would be a really fun one for me to work on in person with someone because it's a little bit more complicated and kind of hard to explain in this nice short training Tuesday. Wow, so that was five um, Ask a Trainer questions in 24 minutes. Um, again, my name is Kayla Fratt. I'm a certified dog behavior consultant. You can find my blog at journeydogtraining.com where you can sign up for phone or video consults. You can also sign up for email support or any of our upcoming courses on kids and dogs or on separation anxiety. You also can check out my podcast at canineconvos.com. That's canine all spelled out. Um, and that's also linked. If you just go to Journey Dog Training, you'll be able to find everything that you need right there. Um, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.